All righty, friends. It looks like it has happened again. Either you did it on purpose or you lost control of your finger and you hit the play button on yet another... Kevin, another unmissable episode of V8 Radio. Unmissable. There you go. That is correct. All right. Well, this is uh, the Unmissable V8 Radio. I'm your host, Kevin Oste, joined as always by our esteemed co-host and co-worker, Mr. Mike Cuball clark I just got a new title. How about that? How about that? Well, we haven't really figured out your title anyway, so. No, no, we haven't. It's all right. (laughs) It's just the cue. That's pretty much it. Yeah, that's pretty much what we say. Hey, somebody call the queue. Figure this out. <laughs> right on. Uh, well, if you uh, are new to the V8 Radio podcast, welcome aboard. Uh, we start off every episode with an automotive trivia question that uh, probes the inner sanctum of automotive knowledge uh, or not. Ooh. And. Uh, <laughs> And who and doesn't you, like to be pro? Uh, yeah, in their inner sanctum. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> have you, in fact, uh, probed your inner sanctum to come up with a Yes, uh, let a me question? pull it out of my inner sanctum here and uh, get it out. All right, well, All before right, you Kevin. do that, before, yeah, hold on, before yeah. you do that, I, I do have a shout-out that we want to... We want to share. This was uh, a really nice comment we got uh, about the VA Radio podcast from our friend, Mr. John Gedhart. And John said, uh, I'm in the, or too bad I'm in the middle of binge listening all the episodes since the podcast started. So I'm still back in April of 2022. Hopefully I'll be caught up in the next few months. So I'll finally know the exciting news, which was the exciting news we released on episode 150. Uh, I listen to my commute. I listen in on my commute to work every morning. Love the show. Actually look forward to going to work now. Ha ha. He says, actually, I like my job too. So uh, I'm glad you like your job, but I'm, I'm happy that uh, you dig the show, John. I appreciate it. Hopefully you'll, you'll hear this, you know, after you get caught up on all the rest of them. But uh, we always appreciate the positive feedback. Um, there was there was another one right after him by a person named Ford Olay, who says this is the best automotive podcast out there, which Whoa. is pretty strong. He's got best in capitals even. Wow. He says, uh, he's been listening to this podcast for the last four years. I have since listened to each episode probably three times while at work and at home. Kevin and Mike are the best. So, Holy cow. thank you, Mr. Ford Olay and uh, Mr. John Gedhart. We're both blushing. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, <laughs> and uh, very, very kind words. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure to do this show. And it makes it even nicer knowing that there are people who actually enjoy listening to it. So, thank you very much. Yeah, that is great. Those are awesome words. Thank you, guys. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I, I had them blown up there on the wall of uh, my garage studio. <laughs> All right. And I can just point to him and say, see, I told you, somebody digs this. I told you I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and people like me. (laughs) Let's not go crazy. (laughs) Uh, All right, so back to the trivia question. Yes, sir. Okay, so here we go. So, Kevin and, uh, and listeners, what car has the distinction of being the longest car to have been a unibody? The longest car to have been a unibody. All right. Yes. So... Let's think here. Unibody or unit mm-hmm. body construction means the uh, the the chassis and the body are one. It's a monocoque, if you will, uh, instead of a body on frame construction. And today, people associate unibodies with small cars, compacts, because it was they're generally lighter in that sense. So you don't have like a mm-hmm. Honda Accord sitting on a full frame. The True. body shell itself is the chassis which also makes them very strong mm-hmm. so but there were some big ones made and there's a couple that come to mind i know the uh, early 60s lincoln continentals were unibody mm, so like really? uh, yeah 1960 all through the you know the, the kennedy lincoln the suicide door yeah. cars those were all unibody construction get out of here um, that's awesome yep as was the thunderbird of the era uh, but bigger than that, I think, were some of the Chrysler products, which were also unibody construction. Um, so I think the Imperials were in that time frame. Uh, but that's not the answer I'm going to provide. Ooh, okay. Yes, yes, yes. 
The answer I'm going to provide is a vehicle that I actually own. And I'm going to say it's the Dodge Maxi Van. Because my Dodge Literally. Maxi Van has a long wheelbase and an even longer rear end, and it is a unit body construction. Is it really? Bigger, yep. I think it's bigger than those Lincolns and those uh, Imperials of the day. Yeah. There's no frame. Huh. I did not it's know that. A, it's just a big steel box going down the road. And huh. if that doesn't, doesn't make you nervous, according to the manual, <laughs> m- mine's a Dodge B200 which means it's supposed to be a three-quarter ton payload van. There's no way. <laughs> There's just no way. <laughs> wow. Way too light of a, and not that it's a light vehicle, but, you know, you think of like a half-ton pickup truck or a three-quarter ton pickup truck, there are stacks of leaf springs and heavy chassis and, you know, an I-beam front axle and all that stuff. Uh-huh. This is not, this is not. <laughs> oh, boy. So, Yeah. So I'm going to say the uh, the extended length Dodge van, just because, is my answer. Okay. I love it. All right. Do- Duly noted, sir. Dodge there Maxi you go. van. Yeah. All right. So what do you got we'll for me? Out. All right. Along the lines of what is the biggest, mm-hmm. um, up to date, and this uh, I will preface this by saying this was something you could buy. What was the largest displacement V8 engine? And how many inches, cubic inches, did it displace? Oh man! So for uh, for a passenger vehicle, yeah, we'll we'll use that market segment. It's not okay. a stationary. It's not a you know powering the crawler that the uh, Apollo. Well, I want to make sure it wasn't part of that of. that giant crankshaft we had a uh, the question of on our hundred fiftieth yeah. episode. Well, interestingly, I guess we'll find out. But anyway, what's your guess? Ah. <laughs> so, what was the largest displacement engine you could buy? V8. V8, okay. Um, mm-hmm. Large And I will caveat that by saying that this data was current up until a couple of years ago. I don't know if it still is. I think it still is. Okay. Huh. That is, ooh, that's a great question. All right. So immediately what comes to mind is the 500 cubic inch Cadillac V8. Ooh. Um, now, you just said it was something you could buy. So that yes. could include crate motors of all mm. shapes and sizes, not just engines available in production vehicles. So I suppose it could. Yeah. So let's see. Our friends at General Motors, Chevrolet in particular, are pretty good about putting out large displacement crate engines. You had a ZZ572. Mm-hmm. You had a, uh, I think they have something out there over 600 cubic in mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. so i'm gonna say for the sake of um of brevity here i'm gonna say uh, non-brevity non-brevity the um it was um chevrolet uh and it was a um 632 mm-hmm. cubic inch v8 632 cubic inch chevrolet v8 which uh, very much so would be uh, uh, a crate you could buy today. Yeah. And, so, yeah, that's that's my answer. Okay, that's a good one. Did you see that that engine has uh, received some new provenance? I have not. Just just this week. Oh, yeah, great, great topic. We've discussed this before. Um, this is, uh, as we're recording this, it's the, the week of the 2023 Hot Rod Power Tour. Correct. And what was revealed on the Power Tour, but the latest iteration... Of Project X, ooh, which is now powered by a Chevy 632 crate V8, and no yes, longer the electric. Yes, sir. Motor. I, I, I did see that. <laughs> that is great news. It is great news. And uh, longtime listeners uh, will remember my story about working the SEMA reveal when Chevrolet decided to unveil that car on that oh, very yeah. stage for the first time in public with an electric motor, and I, I was. I was looking at my rented tuxedo, hoping that I should have sprung for the one that was lined with Kevlar, because I was afraid I was going to get torched. Yeah, they wanted to kill you. Yeah, right. I had nothing to do with it. Uh, exactly. People, yeah. Uh, people came up to me on the street. They, they came up to me online, and they're like, how could you do that? That's not a real yeah. car anymore. You ruined, <laughs> you killed Project X. And I'm like, guys, I just... 
I just showed it off here uh, because it was, you know, a, a public reveal for the first time. But what was interesting about that is the the spin I tried to put on that is that at least here in America, we had the freedom to build something like that mm-hmm. as of that time period and, and still today, which is great. But I am happy that they turned that ship around and went back to an in, you know, internal combustion engine, of course, a super mm-hmm. bad 632 crate engine. So pretty cool. Yeah, that is pretty cool. I'm, I was pretty happy. I just learned that yesterday, and I was I was cheering, you know, to myself watch, watching this video. Like, yes, it's back. And what great. what an animal that thing's going to be, too. Oh, for sure. I was listening to it. Uh, the video I, I saw of it was it backing it, it was backing up into its space, and it just sounds very very angry. It's crazy. I love it. That's that's a thousand plus horsepower i think yeah it's just over a thousand right yeah 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 that's pretty so. serious yeah it is um, very serious. another fun power tour story uh that is currently happening uh you recall a few years ago when us at the v8 speed and resto shop had the distinct honor of reinvigorating restoring re redoing the uh the cop cams camaro the 1969 camaro that's owned by cop Cam. yes it's one of my favorite projects ever. The car is super cool. Um, I first encountered that car on the Hot Rod Power Tour in 1998, I think. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it uh, was used heavily as a promotional car for them, and, and it got kind of worn out, and it went to our shop where we completely stripped it and put a new – we did some metal work on it and new interior and painted it and put a, a new rear suspension, four-link setup in it, and – uh, a different subframe and a big inch LSX um, LS engine featuring all of the comp family of products, fast fuel injection and a TCI six X six speed automatic and lots mm. of really cool stuff in that car. It ran hard, man. It drove really, really, really nice. Right. And they decided uh, the car, our, our friends at driven racing oil um, have the car in their possession along with Scooter Brothers, who was, was the original owner of the white 69 that helped start comp cams back in the, in the 70s. Anyway, they decided to take the car on Power Tour. And it was built to cruise like that. It, it makes 640 horsepower, if I remember correctly, Jeez. naturally aspirated. I mean, it's like a 450-inch big, uh, you know, big LS. Yeah. But it hasn't seen a lot of street action in the past five or six years uh, since we delivered the car. It went to SEMA. It was on display there. It's been spied at a few of uh, the local cruise nights near Memphis where those guys live. Beale Street, you know, really cool stuff. Yeah. But um, they, they admittedly didn't really get a lot of time to drive this. So it departs from Memphis heading out to uh, its first stop for the kickoff of the power tour the other night and I get a phone call and it's Sunday evening and uh, I, the, the name is not in my phone, but the area code Uh-oh. sure is. And it's a, a 901 Memphis phone number. And I'm looking at this saying, yeah, this is probably spam. I'm probably going to ignore that. And it rings and it rings again. And I'm looking at it and it rings again. And I'm like, mm, maybe I'll get this one. <laughs> and it turns out to be uh, my old friend, Chris Brown, uh, who, was one of the first guys I ever met at Comp Cams a million years ago, and he is with the car and Scooter Brothers, and they are uh, uh, stuck on the side of the road with the Comp Camaro. Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> yeah, oh, man. oh, no, is right. Yeah, and, you know, we all had a little chuckle about it because that's also the car that, that famously uh, came loose in the trailer on the way to a power tour stop one year and rolled back and forth and smashed the nose and the tail over and over again in the trailer. Oh, right. Uh, yeah. Oof. And, and, and our 62 Ford galaxy, Kelly and I cruised on power tour next to that car. And, you know, and we had all kinds of problems. So my galaxy and, and that Camaro are no stranger to uh, roadside uh, uh, excursions, roadside assistance. Yep. For sure. Um, they just had an alternator problem. The uh, The alternator was no longer charging. So they're like, what is this? And, and do you have any ideas? So it turns out it's a Wegner front drive. Um, real, It's a, a great front serpentine drive system for those. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Wegner's documentation only says it's a late model GM 
two-wire alternator. So it doesn't really say like 06 Silverado or something. Oh, right. So the, the comp guys, I mean, sorry, the, the driven guys went into, uh, into action and dispatched a few people to AutoZone to try and find a, an alternator. And they said, what do you think? And I said, well, my advice is have them grab a couple of batteries and just put a battery in it and drive it to the next stop where you can not be on the side of the road trying to diagnose this thing. So they did that, uh. and they eventually got a hold of, uh, they went to Summit. There's a Summit Racing warehouse along the way in Georgia, I believe. And uh, he said they tried on like 30 or 40 alternators and none of them fit. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh, man. And, and I'm getting text updates now, you know, throughout the day. And, and this extends into Monday and today's Tuesday. And I'm still getting these updates. And I'm sharing them with the team because uh, they, you know, at the shop, because everybody's, you know, holding their breath on this thing. Well, they got a hold of Wagner Motorsports and, and he's like, Oh, um, let me just beam you down a replacement alternator. So he he overnights that thing as fast as he can, and they installed it today at uh, John Kazi Motorsports. So Ooh, no kidding. Yes, and it's nice to have you know friends in those kinds of places. So they got a, yes. a fun tour of Kazi's to see some of the the engines and the, the boats and all kinds of stuff that he's working on. And then the alternator came in and they popped it in right away, and it was making fourteen and a half volts. And those guys are now back on the road and uh, enjoying the rest of the power tour. So that's pretty cool. Well, right on. And that's what it's all about. I mean, it, there's going to be breakdowns, but uh, people help you out along the way. And that's uh, the, the great community that the power tour is. That's why I love it so much. Yes. And they're down in NASCAR country. So, and, and those guys know a lot of people. So like Richard Childress racing is like, we'll send a truck. I mean, you know, all these people <laughs> kind of went into action to, to help them out. And um, luckily that wasn't that big of a deal. It was just a little inconvenience of a part. And I'm, right. uh, um, um, I'm hoping I'm betting that the rest of their journey is going to be uh, pretty smooth. Cause when, when we let, we sent that car to them, it was, it was pretty dialed. I mean, it, it, it was very sure. reliable. It it made all kinds of power. It steered and stopped really nicely. Um, but then there's that X factor of you know not having put a bunch of miles on it, um, and that's where things start to get a little a little strange. But it's uh, it's all good. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's pretty cool stuff, man. Um, I, I I wanted to go on this power tour, but um... but you got a job. But I got a job I got to do, man. I can't just be running <laughs> off like this. That's right. You crazy? You crazy? So you're uh, you've been now officially on staff for uh, almost a month or a month? Almost huh? a month. Yeah, yeah. On the fifteenth, it'll be one month exactly. So, so uh, what yeah, do we think? Uh, I got to tell you, I'm uh, I'm digging this. It's now. Don't get me wrong. It's this is a real job. I mean, this is <laughs> I mean, things are really you happening here. You were expecting something else. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. But uh, but I mean, things are already they uh, get a little hectic. Things start moving fast, and when they and when things need to happen, they need to happen. And I feel. I feel bad for poor Brian, our, our, the parts manager, having to have been doing this alone. You, Kevin, you should have hired me a year and a half ago, for Pete's sake. Oh, a couple <laughs> years ago, yeah, yeah. Well, you're right, but, and and so you know, Brian is the 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 parts manager, and now you are on staff, you know, working with him, mm -hmm. uh, finding parts and and helping to build out projects. And as you can see, we definitely had the need for additional help in that department. Definitely. Definitely. So Brian is like, listen, hey, can I dump this on you? I got to go take care of this other thing. I'm like, absolutely. Let's have all of it. Whatever you need, let's let's have it. And and I've been learning so much about just different car parts and different um, trim levels and, and different types of interiors and, and all kinds of things that I had mm -hmm. no clue about before, especially cars that I just never really – you know, paid a lot of attention to in the past, and now I'm paying attention, and I'm I'm learning quite a bit. It's and I, and I really enjoy it. So That's there's a lot cool. of information coming through, but um, but I'm here for it. So you're gonna be the big trivia hero at the local cruise nights coming up, right? <laughs> Maybe the big trivia hero at V8 Radio. Hey, hey. yeah, well, it doesn't hurt to dream. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, 
But you'll be able to point out uh, the difference between a, a standard and a deluxe interior and a 67 Camaro from a whole parking lot away. Right. You know? Exactly. I'm like, oh, listen, yeah. that's a deluxe door panel. That's a standard seat. Oh, my. What's this guy doing? Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> well, I do know that, um, again, one of my concerns was that you work remotely from the shop, and I, I didn't want you to feel like you were in a, a vacuum out there kind of by yourself. Right. But at the same time, this type of job, if you can have silence around you and focus, is going to make yeah. all the difference. It is that is very very helpful. Uh, one of the things that would hamstring me a little bit at my, at my last place is you know we, uh, you get along so well with everybody you work around, and there's just a lot of chatter and a lot of things going on, and it's hard to focus when you really have to focus because there's it's just a kind of a calamity all day long. Mm-hmm. So, but being here by myself and and being able to communicate when I need to, you know, Brian, just, yeah. Brian or Trevor, they're are just a phone call away or just a, a message away. And if I have any questions, they've been great about helping me out. But when I need to, you know, to focus, I'm able to do so because you know I you know I don't have any music on and I'm just able to kind of just dig in and and do what I got to do, which is which has been really really helpful. Yeah, you probably didn't realize how much noise was in your your regular day oh it was amazing it was unbelievable just the the night and day difference at the noise level it's crazy you're right i you get used to it and then uh um and and to be honest with you the first couple of days here working out of my house took a little getting used to just because it's probably kind of spooky it's yeah it's just everything is completely different and like okay all right well i'll let's it's fuck let's get get used to this and and figure out how I'm going to make all this work work for me and uh and and I am and it's and everything is working great for me so I'm um, I'm um I'm starting to really you know nestle in here in, in my own little my little office here in in the house and uh, really enjoying it well that's awesome and and I know that uh Brian and Trevor and and the other people on the team have all commented that your uh your contributions are definitely helping uh, because you are easing that load of off of Brian and uh, also mm-hmm. Trevor as as a car comes in and you know the plan starts to come together for all the stuff that it's going to need uh, mm-hmm. that was things that Trevor had to do and he has a lot of other stuff going on so now he kind of sends you that project and you know you mm-hmm. can dive in and do your thing and and same with Brian and again still have that flexibility of if something pops up like right now, which I think I did that to you today. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you uh, did, boss. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Chad, one of our uh, technicians, was putting this 71 Oldsmobile convertible back together, and he's he's doing window regulators and realized that we didn't have the uh, the 71 specific uh, uh, assembly manual for the Fisher body thing for that car. We had the mm-hmm. 71 Cutlass and 442 assembly manual, but that's different from Fisher body. And to, to get the proper diagrams for the, all the workings of inside the door, he's like, Hey, do we have any mm-hmm. pictures? And I'm like, Oh man, we don't have that. So I quickly sent you a message saying, Hey, find one, get it. Yeah. And you got it quick. Yeah. I, I was able to find it quick, which is nice. Um, so I, I hope that helped him. It did. No. Good. I mean, I think so. Right on. Look at so me. that's Already really cool. Useful. Yeah. How about that? That is cool. How yeah. about that? <laughs> I tell you, crazy. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it's it's really good, and and uh, and again, it is helpful. So I'm glad that you're digging it, um, and I'm glad that uh, you're able to get into the groove. You know, a lot of people when the whole work from home thing started during COVID, I think it was different because like everybody was in the same boat. And nobody really knew what right. to expect. And, the, and there was the pandemic, you know, going on. But in this case, this is just a new environment that happens to be at home. And mm-hmm. some people have a hard time getting into that mode of, you know, I'm envisioning that, you know, if, if you, in your case, if you step over the line into your office, it's work time and you step out and it's, it's your house, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I definitely try to maintain some separation. And my, you know, my neighbor and my, my buddy, Robert, he's been working from home for, 20 something years and he oh, wow. he gave me some really good advice where you know just because you know your your quote unquote office is right there you need to end Don't your work day start drinking at 10 in the morning yeah right you need to end your work day when your work day ends and not you know keep going back and forth and 
pretty soon you're going to get burned out on that. I said, ah, that's, that's, that's good advice. So, and he mentioned that too, yeah. the first time we started working from home during the pandemic, that was, that was a real culture shock. Cause I hadn't experienced that before. Um, so you, you almost, you almost get to the point where, well, my computer's right there. I can just hop on real quick. Yeah, it's 10 at night, but I just want to get this thing done real quick. And uh, too much of that, and you start thinking like, oh, my gosh, I'm never, I don't, I, don't, I never stop working. This is crazy. Yeah, don't, don't do it. Yeah. Actually, I got admonished by, um, by the boss lady um, a couple nights <laughs> ago. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I was on the, the messaging uh, system, and I, I put a message through. And to somebody about a car, and it was late at night. It was like ten o'clock. I'm like, oh, I just wanted to get, I just want to get this one thing done. And mm-hmm. so, um, and Kelly messaged me. She's like, what are you doing up, doing work at ten at night? Where is your family? I said, okay, mm-hmm. <laughs> I know where this is going. <laughs> I said, yep. okay, I'm done. She's like, goodbye. I said, okie dokie. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's how that's well, going. <laughs> And she does that all the time, as you've seen. You know, she'll sit up mm-hmm. in the middle of the night and, and throw some notes in somewhere. And uh, she claims it's just because she doesn't want to forget. You know, it's just a right. And and I think that's a little different than sitting up all night and researching and actively working. You know, as opposed to right. popping up, going, "Oh man, I got to remember to do this tomorrow." You know, and put yeah. that note in. Uh, but it's all it's all how you manage it because you don't want to be. And what I I none of us certainly wanted was. Uh, this to become work and it's like oh man this this sucks you know so i'm glad <laughs> yeah. that it's it's not because uh you're doing a good job and we need your help yeah thank you yeah it's definitely not it doesn't feel like a quote-unquote job i mean it's i'm i'm getting paid to shop almost for, for car parts for people yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm spending other people's money i love this this is fantastic yeah, well you're helping you know people yeah. build the car they've always wanted which is really cool yeah, that is cool. The, I, I so, so far, I'd say that the most difficult thing is to find those parts that you know don't exist so much. So, where maybe you need a, a, a piece of a wiring harness, but it's only part of a bigger harness, and you just mm. I don't need this whole harness. I just need this little bit of it, or I need this one part that's not reproduced. Let me you know scour eBay or or, or other other selling sites that. And, or, or the support forums who might have it, or somebody who knows something about it. So th- those are the those are the you know the the uh, the tasks that can really burn up some time and and, and uh, get you really get you really thinking about stuff. But um, but it makes you better. And yeah, you're resourceful enough to be able to chase those things down. And yeah. again, I'll flip it back to considering Brian's day of having to focus on finding stuff like that. Meanwhile, people are coming to him all day long saying, Hey, I need one of yeah. these like now. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. I can tell. I think he's, he's, he's said as much that he's really appreciative that I'm able to take a lot off of his plate so far. And, yeah, you know, I'm still, uh, I'm, I'm super eager to do so and, and to learn more and do more and, you know, be more of a, more of a presence. So I'm looking forward to, you know, being even better. Um, the only thing that really, it's kind of a downer, but you kind of helped me out with the, the other day was, um, not actually being at the shop. I mean, yeah, I, I can, I can focus here and I can, you know, really dig in, but I really like seeing these cars and I really like hanging out with those people. Um, but mm-hmm. you took me on a little FaceTime tour around the shop the other day. Yeah. They showed me, taking me to all the people, seeing all the projects, seeing what state they're in. And, and that was something different too, because I'm looking at all these cars on a spreadsheet, but then I see them in their actual state uh, of disassembly or build. And I'm like, oh, this is, this is where we are with this. Like, oh, yeah. that's crazy. I thought we were, in my mind's eye, I thought we were like, it was like almost all done and I'm, you know, wrapping up, you know, these, these few things, but no, we're, we're, we're still in the, in the, in the heat of it. And uh, so it yeah. was really neat to kind of get that connection again of based on where it is in the spreadsheet and, and to where it is in actuality. Well, I'm glad that, um, you know, you got something out of that. Cause yeah, my mission again was to keep you connected to the, to the action. Mm-hmm. And I'm kind of glad that um, your perspective was one that this car According to the spreadsheet, 
feels like it's pretty close to being finished, even though uh-huh. in reality it's still, you know, way before then. Because that means we're doing a good job of getting ahead of the parts, right? Right. The last thing we want is to go, oh my gosh, that car is almost finished and I don't have half the stuff for it. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> so ideally, you know, the parts all kind of come first so that the team can just build and, and do their do their thing. So that that's actually a good observation. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and, and it, it amazes me how quick these guys work too because um, one of the cars in there, that 49 old sedan delivery, mm-hmm. when I... When I left from my onboarding, that was a whole complete vehicle. And then when you took me on that, our little FaceTime tour around the shop, that whole front end was gone off of that vehicle. I mean, it was completely blown apart. Well, Holy yeah, not cow. only sheet metal engine, but it was just a pair of frame rails sticking out. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would have taken me three, you know, three months to figure out how to do everything there. These guys just <laughs> just knocked it out in probably an afternoon. Uh, yeah, big parts of that came apart um, pretty quickly, which is good. And and uh, yeah. that it, again to see that progress is is a good thing. And and the other note is that um, you know the customers want to see that progress too, so we do our photo galleries and, and we're constantly taking pictures and uploading all the photos and, and Joe, our, you know, sales and customer relations guy, mm-hmm. he'll walk through and, and shoot individual videos for customers and, you know, keep them up to date uh, also. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's funny is being in the shop every day, the progress doesn't seem as dramatic because we're seeing, you know, the step-by-step, but like uh-huh. in your case, you step out for a week or so and then look back in and go, Oh man, a lot's changed here. And, yeah, um, that's good to know also. And, and I don't know how I can uh, relay that concept to some of the guys, uh, you know, and gals on the crew that are hands on very close to projects all the time. Um, I think maybe what I need to do is just we should probably just review last week's photos every once in a while and just say, guys, look how much you've done. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Speaking of photos, those photo galleries that are taken are have been priceless for for me <laughs> right on because i'm so so to paint the paint the picture for our for our audience um we have a spreadsheet um and a lot of these parts on these cars are are inventoried as to whether or not they can be reused um mm-hmm. or whether they need to be replaced um somebody may you know may say door panel and you know it needs to be replaced so that that can be a little bit vague where I don't know what door panel it has currently. I don't know if it's, mm. you know, again, if it's a standard interior, if it's, if it's a deluxe interior, if it had power window switches on it or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so that photo gallery is typically, you're going to see a, a shot of the door open on the inside of the door panel. And then from that, you can discern exactly what door panel I need to get and what pieces I need to get that attach that door panel to be able to to replace that whole door panel again. So th- those pictures that I've learned are are gold for for trying to research some of this stuff. Well, that is awesome to hear because that was half the original intent of the photos. There's actually three halves, if you will. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first half was for the customers to be able to follow along. Uh, the second mm-hmm. half was for people who are cruising the internet and and want to see our work. Here you go. Yeah. Uh, but the third half of that is exactly what you're saying. And I think you are taking advantage of that um, like all the way because a lot of times people can just go in the shop and just walk up to the car and look at it or go out and right. to the parts warehouse and look at the part or whatever. Um, but that's not always the most efficient way to do things. Uh-huh. Uh, and we, we take photos of everything. And when you know every part that comes off the car is photo documented uh, and put in the gallery also, so that when it comes time to put the car back together, a technician might say, hey, I need this, and our warehouse team needs to be able to know what that part is, uh, especially if there is a question, you know, if there's two or three or, you know, whatever, and can pull up the picture right away and go, this one? Yes, that's the one. Go get it. But I know that um, in the past, I've, I've been guilty of trying to mentalize all of the required pieces for a particular task. Uh, without thinking to look at the picture as a 
cheat sheet, you know, is a, a, yeah. a guide of all the stuff that's required for that. <clears throat> so that's cool. I'm glad that yeah, that's working out there too. Yeah, that's great because because a door panel may have an emblem on it. It may have a separate armrest uh, and a base and a pad. And then the, the, the hardware that attaches, you know, a lower panel, maybe an upper panel, you know, all kinds of things. I mean, and a handle. Escutcheons, yes. <laughs> Door knob escutcheons, yes. Yes. <laughs> so, and window crank escutcheons. Yeah, window crank and a little gaskets and, and the clips and all that. I mean, there could be 30 pieces just on a one door panel. It's, it's insane. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes, uh, again, the assembly manual concept will have a blown apart diagram sometimes, but a lot of these things have been photocopied 50 million times and you can't oh, really right. you know, see it as well. And especially when you're trying to assess the condition of the one we have. Um, because, right. again, somebody might say, hey, replace this door panel. And that decision you know, may or may not be solid based on other factors like well, can we get another one? You know, or is this the last, do we have to restore this one? Right. Uh, or what's really wrong with this thing? You know, is it something that, uh, you know, so is, is, however you can get a handle on the condition of everything is, is, uh, is pretty critical when it comes to all this stuff. So mm. I also, I'll invite the rest of the world to peruse our photo galleries because they're all public. And if you go yeah. to v8speedshop.com, right in the middle of the page, there's a button that says photos, click that. And then a drop down comes up and it's, it's almost every car we've worked on. Um, there's a bunch of them that are not there for whatever reason, but they, the years lay out from early to late. So I think the earliest one is 1923, yeah. maybe. Yeah. And then maybe. they go all the way up from there. And, and if you are working on a Chevelle or a Camaro or a Mustang or a Corvette or uh, a Charger or, you know, any anything, any muscle car, second gen Firebirds, Trans Ams, um, Monte Carlos, shoebox mm-hmm. Chevys, uh, fat fendered, you know, forty six Fords. We have pictures. Dodge Murata. Dodge Murata. Yes, yeah. <laughs> square square body pickup truck. We have pictures of all this stuff, and uh, you're more than welcome to uh, to click through, and you'll see the thumbnail. You click the thumbnail, it blows up, and if you right click on the blow up picture and hit open in a new tab, it'll blow up even bigger. So you can get even closer Ooh, to the action. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I'm happy to, to share that knowledge. And, uh, and if people have questions, I'll just steer them to you. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm your guy. <laughs> yeah. There you go. You hear that people. <laughs> That's it. Right on. Just call the queue. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know about this point of this show, we have people that are saying, you know, two episodes ago, you promised us the van story in episode 151, which we did not do because we did our conglomerate episode with our friends at Stubborn German. And and hopefully that was well received. I think so. I think that was a fun episode. I think so. It was a heck of a lot of fun to do it. (laughs) (laughs) From from what you remember? (laughs) From what I remember, I thought it was great. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That, that oh, was fun. my goodness. Uh, so then we said, oh, okay, well, in... in, in Q. <laughs> yeah, D-R-U-N-Q, I think is how you spell yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Uh, so then we promised to uh, to share that story in 152, which is what this episode is. So mm-hmm. um, the, the good thing is, by uh, going off on that initial tangent, we have to truncate this a little bit because this story... We tried to recap this, you and I and, and our friend Grady yeah. and Paul, uh, on another little trip that'll be probably the subject of 153. And yeah, um, right it took three hours. Yeah, it took a long time to get it all <laughs> to, out. To get nobody anywhere could, in the story. Nobody could say, no, that didn't happen. This happened before that happened. Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, so we'll we'll set the scene here. And it was, uh, so I have this 79 Dodge Maxi van that, that, I referenced in the beginning of the show, and there's another previous episode where you can hear the whole story of how that thing came to be, and I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. But um, as of about a month ago uh, or so, I had accumulated about 550 miles on this thing of local driving, highway driving, longest trip of about an hour, and figured, this thing's pretty sorted out. Let's go on a road trip, right? Why not? What what can happen? Uh, what could possibly of, go wrong? Speaking of road trips and being on the side of the road, 
So yeah. um, our buddy and I, uh, uh, Grady, jumped in the van on a on a Friday morning with the intent of going from the St. Louis metro area up to Chicago to see some friends, see yourself, uh, some family members of mine, cousins, and uh, go have a nice day uh, checking out a baseball game from a bar. We've been doing this for years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then stay the night, turn around, come back home, just do a quick little weekend. Well, it was actually going to be a two-night thing. We're going to see some friends on one night, and then the next night see everybody for the game, and then come back on a Sunday. Right. And a solid plan, you know. And the great yeah. thing about the van is that uh, there's some room in the back, you know, for tools and whatnot. Yeah. So uh, Kelly threw some moving blankets in the van, which was a stroke of brilliance that uh, I, I soon learned to appreciate. But uh, we're heading heading north up, uh, you know, Illinois Interstate 55, and about an hour and 20 maybe north of where we started from, it felt like somebody just flipped an off switch and then turned it back on and turned it off and turned it on because the van was stalling out, but rapid fire. So imagine oh taking a light switch and just flipping it on and off and on and off and on and off but doing that with the ignition system and, and that's what it would do. And then it recovered and uh, Grady and I look at each other like, what the hell? And it went away and we kept driving. I knew something was up obviously, but um, right. wasn't really sure what. So my mind is immediately thinking, you know, ignition or, or fuel, you know, one or the other. Mm-hmm. So you weren't on staff yet at that point. Um, but I, Correct. Put a message out to parts guy Brian and said, "Hey, here I am on the map, going north. Can you find the closest parts store that maybe has a coil, maybe a fuel pump, um, and and see if there's anything in stock so I can do a quick parking lot fix of of what I might need, right? Right. And uh, of course, Brian jumped on that in minutes, and uh, he messages me back, and he's like, "Okay, well, two exits up the road, you have a." Um, I think it was an O'Reilly's or an Auto's, you know, a big chain store yeah. that has uh, has the ignition coil. And by the way, there's two different kinds of coils for that thing, different tips on them for the coil wire, which I never knew on a Chrysler 360. And uh, and they're on the counter. They're paid for, ready to go. Just walk in and grab what you need. And then down the street the other way is another parts store that has the fuel pump, and that's paid for and done. Just walk in and grab it, and you're good to go. So I'm like, awesome, you know? <laughs> yeah. So... We get there and uh, pull the doghouse off of the, the van to reveal the engine. And we notice right away that, that uh, Grady pulls the coil wire off the, the old coil and it basically just falls off. It was like oh, not brother. seated on the, on the coil, right? And there you go. learning about this, yeah, this new two different type of connector scenario, we deduced that the van had the wrong coil wire for the coil that it had. And maybe it was flapping in the breeze going down the road. And, and killing the spark and stumbling the van. Right. Great. So we uh, switched the coil for a new one that had the correct connector on it and put it all back together and fired up and go down the road and we're golden, you know, for 15 minutes. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. And this continued to happen to where we would drive, it would start to stumble, we would stop, we would evaluate, we would try to fix We'd start it up, it would drive again, and then it would stumble, and, and the cycle would repeat. But the time between stumbles was getting shorter. So it went from 25 minutes to 20 minutes to 15 minutes to, at the yeah. very end of the night, we had about about 12 seconds of runtime <laughs> oh, before brother. it stalled. Because it went from stuttering to completely dying. And along the way, just to hit some of the high points of what we did, uh, I'm thinking there's junk in the fuel filter, even though we just put one on, changed the fuel filter. I noticed that uh, the fuel filter hose, the rubber hose around it was soft, so it was perhaps collapsing, so we changed that out. Uh, I took the top half of the carburetor apart uh, at this rural parts store parking lot. They did not have any parts for it, and we were still two hours out of Chicago if we were on the interstate. And I remember talking to the parts guy saying, hey, can you get me a carb kit for this thing? Oh, yeah, it's in Chicago. It'll be here in two days. (laughs) Uh, Can you get me a carb? I'll just change it. 
Uh, yeah, that's in Chicago. It'll be here in three days. So oh, gee whiz. over and over again, we had to make the decision of for the situation, what's the best thing to do here? And, and I wanted to completely disassemble the carburetor and clean it all out and, and put it back together. And yeah. Grady's like, you know, if you drop something in the parking lot here and the, on the rocks, we'll never find it. And we can't, yeah. then we can't go anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Then we're stuck. Then we're going to have to wait so, those three days <laughs> to get those, that carburetor. For sure. Which, at the same time, we did have a cooler full of drinks in the back, and, you know, it's mm. got a couch and everything. We thought, well, we'd just sleep in this thing if it comes down to it, you know. <laughs> we'd just yeah. take a vacation in a field <laughs> and, and wait. <laughs> but when this first started happening, Grady's like, hey, uh, it almost seems like, you know, something's getting stuck in the in the fuel line or, or you know, the pickup is jammed or whatever, and... And my mind immediately went to, well, what can we fix, right? Maybe not what's actually wrong with this thing, but what can we fix as we're on the road? So I didn't doubt that that might have been an opportunity to be happening, but this it didn't point to it because the, the van's got a plastic fuel tank. Uh-huh. So I kind of ruled out it being full of rust and crust because this plastic tank, it's in perfect shape, you know. I, I, I doubt right. that that's what it is. Plus, we changed out a bunch of the fuel lines and the filter, Plus, at one point, we finally, you know, make it up to Chicago, and we're 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 at that point where the thing is going to run. It runs for thirty seconds, and then you got to shut it off for five minutes, and then start it up, and then rev it up, and throw it in gear, and and get as far as you can in thirty seconds, and then it right. dies, and you coast down. And we're in that scenario. And um, at one point, we pulled the fuel line off the carburetor and cranked the engine, and uh, it was it was still producing fuel. It wasn't like a a spray, but it was, you know, in my opinion, clearly enough to run the thing. Mm-hmm. And some of the roadside fixes, we ended up bypassing the fuel system with a an electric fuel pump, and the that didn't matter. It it still did the same thing, and we put a distributor in it. Uh, we met some really nice people at the twenty four hour Auto Zone on uh, Tui Avenue in Chicago. It's kind of the the hub store for people in that area and these these folks just were like what do you need you know let's just help you yeah out. and it was it was great we bought an ignition module these chrysler's are known for the module getting hot or failing and um, mm-hmm. the balance resistor you know we're replacing all the stuff that would point to to this exact symptom you know right and it's and, also uh, it's important to note that you had put about 400 or so miles on this van already, and you had done a lot of repairs to it to make it roadworthy to get ready for this trip. So this wasn't just something you went into, you know, willy-nilly and just threw caution to the wind. You you were prepared for this. Well, yeah. I right. mean, like I said, I think about 550 miles were on it. And yeah. I, I owned the thing from September to April, you know, so there was there was time. And yeah, yeah and that, in that time period, we did the brakes and put wheels and tires on it and did, mm-hmm. uh, you know, tune-ups. And I had replaced the carburetor that was new and, you know, all the bulbs and electric little nonsense. So it was, it was pretty yeah. solid. But it's yeah. thrown us this curveball to where it runs and then it dies and it runs and it dies. And we, we basically missed our big event on Saturday uh, because we were dicking around trying to get this thing to run. And at that point, the mission shifted from going up for a – a weekend with our friends to we need to just get this thing home somehow. <laughs> right. And the funny thing was, oh, is man. it would die. And, and, and thankfully these, these Dodge products of the era had a, a gear reduction starter. So it's easier for the starter to spin the engine over than a traditional uh, standard drive starter, which made it possible for us to crank this thing over probably a thousand times <laughs> over those yeah, couple right. days trying to restart it and keep it alive. And and mm-hmm. the, the worst part of it was, you know, it was a little bit of a novelty and a little bit of road trip adventure, you know, and, and thankfully, uh, you know, my traveling companion, uh, it was of the mindset that it didn't matter. We didn't have anywhere to be. It's okay. Let's just figure it out, you know. So uh, there are people that would have gone out of their mind and said, just flatbed this thing home and be done with it. Right. And we both had kind of the spirit of adventure to try and, you know, I'm kind of pig headed that way. I want to, I want to fix it, you know, I want to figure it out. And he was cool with that, you know, which was good. Um, but at one point where it was late, it was like, I don't know, one in the morning, 
uh, Friday night. We actually made it to my buddy's house about 10.30 p.m., stayed there, saw some friends, jumped back on the road to go, I don't know, 15 miles or so to where our hotel was, and it took us like three and a half hours to get there. Oof. Uh, <laughs> in the Ooh. middle of the night uh, in Chicago. And at one point, we were on, on a, an expressway where – there's a, a merge, an on-ramp coming on, and there's three lanes of, of straight traffic, and we're in the rightmost lane right where these things converge. And it's the middle of the night. There's people winging past us at, you know, 80, 90 miles an hour, and we're just on the other side of a hill. So we, would, we were this giant surprise of somebody's coming along, and it's late at night on Friday night. Who knows if these people are impaired behind the wheel coming over a hill and then seeing this van that's not moving and, and the hazards are barely flashing because we're almost out of battery power. That's the point where we looked at each other and said, this, this is where we die, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> this is how it ends. So, all right. This is, yeah, th- this is going to be it. And we, you know, as, as morbid as it sounds, kind of prepared for it because it has lap belts, you know, like, like airplane style seat belts. Yeah. And these captain's chairs from 1979, and we were debating. It's like, are we going to be in worse shape if we wear these seat belts and get hit in the back at 70, 80 miles an hour, or if we don't wear the seat belt and and not risk having our spine separated when we get hit? Oh, you know, geez. these were the conversations <laughs> that we were having. So thankfully, <laughs> that you know that didn't happen. Um, but it took all of our brain power to run these scenarios of what's going on in this stupid van and this in this in this system, and uh, so the shift then became just get it home, maybe not fix it, just get it home, and not tow mm-hmm. it home, but but what can we, you know, just kind of temporary rig, and uh, Grady had pointed out that uh, we could run this thing and keep it alive by spraying carb cleaner down the down the carburetor. Okay, so. That was pivotal because then we knew we had spark. We knew we had ignition. We had a fuel right. problem. And even though we could see fuel and whatever, it that was the problem. So we took that electric pump that uh, we had bought and a big section of hose and really just kind of got down and dirty with it and left the doghouse off and took a, a gallon jug of gasoline and our <laughs> fire extinguisher, which we had. And mm-hmm. ran a hose with our electric pump right into the gas can, right into the carburetor inlet, and put a toggle switch under the hood and started the thing up, and and it ran. It stayed alive. Hey. So yes. Uh, so we didn't fix it, but we made it functional again. Yeah. And then to drive the thing 300 miles home, <laughs> 350 oh, miles, whatever. We did the math. We went to another uh, AutoZone and bought all of their five-gallon gas cans and then a, a one-gallon and said, well, we're just going to rotate these suckers out. You know, we'll, we'll keep a five-gallon full and then another yeah. five-gallon full and then a one-gallon spare for reserve because that, that's going to get us, I don't know, 10 miles maybe, eight miles. Right. And uh, the fuel gauge became lifting up the can and seeing how light it's getting. <laughs> <laughs> Got about forty and, miles left. <laughs> well, I mean, honestly, that's that's what we were doing, and and uh, we started driving this thing. And today, you know, you can't buy a gas can that's got any kind of a nozzle on it that is usable by humans because they've got all these goofy <laughs> safety things and environmental BS on them. So we we determined that we could cut that in half and and release the locking mechanism, and it was a snug fit for our fuel hose. So oh, that's that great. It, it yeah it worked out nice and and if we wanted to we could have wrapped it with tape or something on top of that turns out we didn't really have to we could just shove it down in there and uh, we went through the first few gallons and we're like hey we we did not articulate it we weren't going to say hey it's working because yeah. that's when it would have failed but we <laughs> exactly. kind of nodded to each other like oh, I think we might be able to do this and uh, <laughs> we're going down the road and uh, it was at this point that Grady said. Yeah, okay, I think I'm going to cancel my flight then. <laughs> and I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I found the last, the last flight out of Chicago, um, and I bought myself a ticket. I, I didn't get you one because I didn't have one. <laughs> but, but don't worry, I'll, I'm going to cancel and stay with you, you know. And it was oh, kind of a running a joke. That, yeah, he canceled his plane ticket. He also canceled his rental car. 
and uh, the train, all for you, you know, buddy. <laughs> I know. Well, because we had a glimmer of hope finally. Right. And realistically, he had to be back uh, to go to work. You know, so uh, sure. we went to to your house, which was on the way home. Yeah. And that was kind of proof of concept. We made it there. And uh, at that point, we decided to button this thing up a little bit, put the doghouse back on it. Uh, you made us a nice little shim that would yeah. lift that doghouse up so we could feed the fuel hose from yeah. the gas can underneath and, and feed the engine. And from there on, man, uh, we just rotated fuel cans and made it all the way home without a hitch. That is so, Now, that is perseverance, if I've ever heard it. That is fantastic. It was perseverance, um, yeah. determination. Again, to me, it wasn't that stressful. It was really mm-hmm. the challenge of doing it all. And I was kind of right. pissed, you know, because I'm like, I got this great idea. Maybe it's this. And yeah, let's do it. And we put it all together and it, do- it dies again. And it's like, damn it. You know, I was just, I was more yeah. mad at the thing than anything else. Um, mad at myself that I couldn't figure it out and just, I guess, determined to figure it out. So, Got it home, parked it for a few days, didn't really look at it, uh, and then got some time to uh, to do further diagnosis. And I, I really, you know, was thinking it, it's got to be something fuel related. So it turns out that we were unable to pull fuel from the tank. Right. Yeah. Grady had the ball bearing theory going on, right? Yeah. Like something was blocking up that fuel line. And yeah. even though at one point we saw that fuel was coming into the carburetor, what was happening is that um, the fuel pump would create its vacuum and, and suck fuel up, which would tighten something into the fuel line, into the pickup, mm-hmm. and, and restrict, and that's what would shut it off. And then you'd shut the van off for a few minutes, and that <clears throat> vacuum suction would release, and then you'd start it up again, and it was able to pull some fuel in until it bound and I learned this right. by taking the, the fuel tank down. Uh, so I put the van on a lift, and I crawled underneath there. And, and uh, I took the straps off to remove the plastic tank, and I'd take the hoses and the filler neck and all that stuff out. And I can't get the tank down. I'm, I'm looking <laughs> at this thing going, why isn't this falling on me? And, of course, at the, the whole trip, we had just put, like, 30 gallons of fuel in this thing. <laughs> Fantastic. You know? So I had to siphon pump all of that out uh, and then drop this tank. Well... After looking at this thing every way possible and taking my phone and sticking it up there and trying to take pictures of on top of the tank and looking at the manual and online and all this stuff, it turns out that I just said, well, screw it. I'm just going to rip this thing down. Maybe it's just kind of time welded, you know, to the bottom of the the van. And I rip it down and it turns out that whoever did the custom van conversion back in 79 drilled wood screws through the floor into the top of the tank when they were putting God the carpeting bless America. in. America. <laughs> so, you know, just like a cheap apartment, it's got a subfloor, so you got your steel <laughs> van floor, and then they screwed, you know, some plywood down before they put their four inches of plush shag carpeting. And uh, when they put the ply down, it drilled right through the fuel tank and was holding it to the bottom of the van. And, and luckily, it was doing that because the screws closed up all the holes that they put in the tank. Um, otherwise well, this thing would good. have been a, a vapor bomb, you know, just yeah. waiting to go off. Yeah. Not a, not a lot of engineering going on at our friends at Goshen, Indiana, is there? Uh, yeah. Concept engineering. Yeah. 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 There was, they were conceptualizing something. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I cut all, I cut all the screws flush and, and filled all the holes in the tank with some JB epoxy and, uh, yeah. took the fuel sender out and found out that true to, to his, uh, his theory, the sock filter on the on the intake part of the tube was deteriorated, and there was gunk just clogged up inside the fuel pickup, and gunk that would bind under vacuum and release a little bit mm-hmm. under no vacuum, and that was the on-off effect of the fuel supply. It, it is really bizarre that it took so many miles for that to manifest itself. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like why? Why didn't it do it right away? Why didn't it behave that way? Maybe it just wasn't deteriorated enough. Um, well, to uh, to do that, and, and, and that part I'm actually used to also because this is what happens whenever we finish a car. You know, you finish a restoration or you build a car or even yeah. do a big upgrade on something. 
um, it might take a little while for something to shake loose or something to fail, even though it's new. Yeah. Uh, so it didn't surprise me. Um, and I, I replayed this whole scenario in my mind a million times. And, and I stand by the decisions I made because, again, I don't know if you've ever heard that joke of the guy who uh, he's, on a, <laughs> he's on a street corner at night under a street light. And he's looking at the ground. And this guy comes up to him and says, what's going on? And he goes, I lost my watch. And he said, oh, well, where'd you lose it? Somewhere here in the corner? And he goes, well, no, I lost it on the next block. But the light's better here. So, you know. <laughs> And that's what I was doing. I was looking at things that I could fix on the road, you know, that were minimal risk as opposed to finding what was actually wrong with it because I couldn't take a 30-gallon fuel tank down on the side of the road. It just wasn't going to happen. Right, exactly. So fix everything else, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, But every one of the things that we took care of was, you know, either bound to fail anyway or Mm -hmm. had a little something to do with it. But... Yeah, you had a lot of little things that were contributing to a bigger problem. um, And you really got a lot of those things knocked out, which is great because they would have been bigger issues down the road. And I think you were telling me when you got home, you did pull that carburetor apart and you found like a a bleed tube or an idle tube that was that was that was blocked. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a a new a new reman carburetor. Right that had only been on there for now, you know, a thousand miles or so, 1500 miles. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it was having trouble idling. It was, it was stumble off idle. And when yeah. I took the whole thing apart, I found that, yeah, there's an air bleed tube that goes down and it's got tiny holes perforated in it for the, the air to flow through, mm-hmm. uh, and, and little fuel nozzle. And it was, it was jammed solid with like ca- calcium, you know? <laughs> oh, wow. So, it was plugged, and I that that made it through the remanufacturing process. I'm convinced. I'm convinced that that plugged tube was there before they remanufactured it, and it remained plugged through the process. And then I put it on the van, and it was still plugged. So once I cleaned that out with this little needle and a little file, and you know some carb cleaner mm-hmm. and whatnot, um, oh, it idles a million times better. You know, and and that little part throttle stumble is like is gone. That's so, great. It was good to go through all that, but um, sure, it was an adventure for sure. <laughs> the adventure of a lifetime, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was man. Uh, that is it was that is crazy. Yeah, That's um, it. and not as nuts as you know twenty some years ago when we had to put an engine in the galaxy overnight and you know on power right. tour and all that kind of stuff. There's road warrior stories that are are far more road warrior than this um but the difference on this one is that neither one of us were really upset by it in fact at the end of the trip i'm like hey dude i'm sorry you know this was this was kind of a bus wreck and he's like well no 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 i mean i I enjoyed it and i said well (laughs) i I, I did too (laughs) i just you know i didn't want your your weekend vacation to be this and he's like no i i thought it was cool you know we, we we problem solved and we tried stuff and there was that that you know one of the greatest stories ever told is the one where the they can't get home you know we were like apollo yeah right (laughs) (laughs) your own personal apollo 13 mission oh that's great we had to make the square fuel pump fit in the round hole to scrub yeah you had a successful failure that's great we did we did we had a successful failure how about that how about Uh, that congratulations yeah so the good thing is you know, got it home, got it fixed, drove it around, and uh, comfortable with it enough to where Kelly actually got in it again, and she's like, "All right, well, let's take this." So, all right, uh, good stuff. That's all good, yeah. So that was the very short version of the adventure. Yeah, that is an impressive van up close and personal. That there's yeah, that a was lot the first going time you saw it. There. Yeah, it is first time I saw it. Well, <laughs> and it was so funny because, again, we're limping this thing around the city streets of Chicago trying to get to parts stores and whatnot. And, uh, on the, the spare tire cover I had made, and it has an old style beer logo on it, uh, which was a straight up tribute to my (laughs) dad. He'd used to drink old style like crazy. And, uh, I had the spare tire cover made and people 
this whole adventure, we didn't get stopped by a single cop or a single person on the side of the road. Everybody just would see the van on the side of the road and then they just get this big smile on their face like, oh yeah, check that out. You know, and then they go on their merry way. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't realize that we were stranded, you know, we couldn't move or right. whatever. <laughs> and that van has that effect on people. People just really, they, they get a smile out of it. It's just something you don't see every day. It's a big goofy thing. But later on, I'm in a Facebook group of old style beer aficionados, if you will, yeah. And all of a sudden, the lead image is is my van going through an intersection in Chicago that some guy took the photograph from a, a tow truck <laughs> and posted it on Facebook going, hey, check this out. Look at this guy's got old style on his van. <laughs> that is unbelievable when I saw that. Yeah. That just and really somebody, made my day. Somebody saw it and sent it to me. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know, because I didn't know that happened. Um Right. Because quite honestly, if I knew that, that that tow truck was there, I probably would have hitched a ride with him, you know. <laughs> yeah. Hey, buddy, can you hook me up? <laughs> For sure, literally. <laughs> yeah. But uh, For sure. Who knows? So that that was a lot of fun, though. Yeah, man. The, that. I mean, I'm, I'm glad you guys still made it up. I mean, you, you, you did end up getting to hang out for a little bit, which was great. Uh, I know it took forever, and I know that... Uh, it was it was quite a uh, quite an ordeal, but we're glad you made it and got to have some fun and um, kind of decompress a little bit from it. So, good stuff. You were fully decompressed, I think, by the time we. I met was up with you guys. a thousand percent decompressed, as a matter of fact. Because you had just is that one like the day you resigned from your previous gig? I think it was or right about about then? about the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we did take a few minutes and meet you guys at a bar down the street from where the hotel was. Got there probably 10 o'clock, 1030 at night. And, yeah. Uh, the queue <laughs> was D-R-U-N-Q. If I was drinking uh, <laughs> old style, I would have been fully croisoned. <laughs> That's right. And naturally carbonated. <laughs> and naturally carbonated. <laughs> exactly. Uh, too funny. Yeah, so the good, good thing time. is uh, also... Um, Grady and I are still buddies after all that. Uh, right on. <laughs> and uh, the, a couple weeks after uh, Memorial Day weekend, we took another road trip. And uh, that'll be a story yeah. for another time. But you took the GTO, and yep. uh, our buddy Paul took his 62 Buick, and you guys came south from the Chicago area. Grady jumped behind the wheel of his 72 Bronco that we did a coyote swap on, and I drove our 62 Ford Galaxy north. And we all met in the middle of the state, in a, the town of Normal, Illinois, where I went to college. Paul went to college. Your daughter goes mm -hmm. to school there. Yep. And uh, we had a day, and it was cool. It was fun. It was a really cool day. I was I was really happy that we're all able to get out and, and hang out and get together and do that. we got to do that more often. Yes. The mission is to drive the cars more and really just yes. enjoy the day. Because it, it, I used to think people were being hokey when they're like oh yeah stress relief man i i just get behind the wheel or you know I, I ride my harley and the world goes away but you know what it does so yeah. do it <laughs> amen i recently amen. found a photograph uh of the odometer of my galaxy that was taken in 2013 so 10 years ago mm -hmm. and looking at the mileage it turns out that i've averaged 880 miles a year in that car for the past 10 years that's cool, man. It needs to be a lot more than that. Well, yeah, but it's, but it it's good cool. that you're getting miles on it. Yes. Every chance so, I get, I, I try to drive yeah. that thing. Yeah, same here. I uh, Actually, I just took the GTO uh, to a car show uh, on this past Saturday. Our our high school had a, a their band boosters uh, put on a car show, their first car show ever. Nice. And it was a quarter mile away from my house. It was the, the best location ever. And um, there's about 50 cars there and um, some really unique stuff. I mean, it, it wasn't just a muscle car show. It was, you know, all makes and models. So there was a 92 Celica with Lambo doors there. There was Ooh. like a some Boy Racer STI. There was a um, uh, like a 54 Packard. Um, nice. Yeah, re some really cool stuff. A, 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 um, a 70 um, a GS Stage 1 was there i sent you a oh picture yeah you of. took pictures of that one yeah that yeah. was a cool car i think that was a 71 yeah 71 rather yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Um, Old, beautiful car but yeah a lot of really cool cars showed up there so i was i was pretty happy and and the and the the organ the band boosters were super happy because they were 
they were pretty nervous. Like, well, we've never done anything like this before. And it was all just, you know, it was $20 to, um, to register. And there wasn't like a, a ton of trophies. The band director gave out a most unique trophy award. Uh, nice. And he picked that, he picked that 92 Celica with Lambo doors. So um, it was unique. It was pretty unique. Um, <laughs> but it was just to get together and just to support the band and, and see cool cars. And it was a, it was a great success. So I think it's going to get even bigger next year. So awesome. Was, yeah. My wife is part of that committee and she was really happy that, uh, um, that's how you got all- your trophy. <laughs> I didn't get a trophy. <laughs> I did win through the, uh, a Milwaukee drill, uh, through one of the uh, door prizes, which was fun. Oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Hey, heck yeah. So, yeah, right on. Yeah, so they did That's all awesome. right. They, you know, made a few bucks on the uh, on the entry fee, on the registration fee. Uh, some sponsors gave some money. Other sponsors gave, you know, water and food and uh, and prizes. So it was a nice little deal. There so, you go, man. Love that. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah. That I'm also planning on um, when I come down, back down to the shop at the end of June. I want to take the GTO down with. Me. Awesome. So, um, yeah, so that'll be a fun drive. Yeah, you've made that drive before. Should be yep. no problem. Should be. <laughs> Let's not say that too loudly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'll. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. That'll be cool. I do also want to do some more road trips up that way too. Maybe next time we'll take the Riv. Brought the van, took the Galaxy out. Maybe I'll take the Riv next time. We'll see. Dig it. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, I know that uh, our list, our two listeners that used to like us anyway, are uh, waiting for the uh, (laughs) trivia question answers. You're like enough of this drivel. What are the answers? All right. So So I asked you, Kevin, um, what car has the distinction of being the longest car to have ever been constructed with uh, unibody construction? Um, And you said, well, the 60 Lincolns were pretty long and... They were unibody, you know, the Kennedy Lincoln and uh, Chrysler Imperials. But you landed on the Dodge Maxi van as being the longest car. And you touched on that Imperial, and I thought you were going to land there. Because while the Maxi van has an overall length of 234.5 inches, the 1973 Chrysler Imperial clocked in at 235.3 inches. That last inch. The five mile per hour bumpers mandated in seventy three is what gave it the extra length. So I sniffed around it. Um, you did, but I'll tell you, you what, did. that was not including the old style spare tire cover. No, <laughs> well, you so know what? That, was Imperial. that factory, sir? Was that factory? <laughs> <laughs> the tire was maybe. Yeah, right. actually, it, it, the spare was an original tire to the van. It's like never been on the ground. Oh, Goodyear brother. power cushion or something. <laughs> uh, man. Uh, well, cool. At least I was on the right track, you know? And sometimes yeah, you that's were right good there. enough. Yeah. Yeah. We'll call 73, it. though. I'm, I'm impressed uh, that it was that late because I was thinking I was too, cars. To be honest with you. Yeah. But they did get big. But what's funny right, is well, the, I'm sorry, what's funny is the 59 Lincoln has is the longest wheelbase. Um, at 131 inches, but the the Imperial is actually overall length is longer with 127 inch. I yeah. thought that was a pretty interesting stat. That is big cars. So gotta love them. Yeah, man. Sorry, continue. All right. So my question to you is, uh, what was the biggest V8 that you could buy? And yeah. you said, does this go with the giant crankshaft yeah. question from before? <laughs> which the fact it was a V8, I think, ruled that out because that giant yeah, crank, I right. believe, was for you're a straight. Right engine and then you said how about the 500 inch cadillac v8 and then you said well chevrolet had a crate 572 maybe something bigger than 600 and you said i know what it is it's the 632 cubic inch chevrolet v8 that came out i don't know a year and a half ago maybe yeah two years like probably by now uh and we we uh commented that that is currently found in project x um and that's certainly a giant displacement v8 but it is not the biggest but not the giant displacement v8 no the giant one is a sunny leonard engine known as the godfather big block and it's 1005.8 cubic inches wow and it's big block chevy pattern it's a race engine it's a like a i don't think it's pro stock but good it's god a, uh, a full race engine built by sunny it's, he passed a couple of years ago but 
Sonny's racing engines is still out there, still probably still making them. The the mountain motors with the giant cylinder heads and it's all billet, you know, custom. Yeah. Probably hundred and fifty thousand dollar engine. But uh to date, I think that is the largest V eight for a passenger car at a thousand and five point eight cubic inches. Wow, that thing's gotta be I mean <laughs> That's a big one. Just the, 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 the outer dimensions have to be immense. Yeah, they're huge. <laughs> For sure. Wow, that's so there you go. crazy. Well, good question on that, 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 uh, that, that longest uh, uh, unibuy. It's a great question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right, man. That was uh, one was of my own questions, too, by the way. I'll have you know. That was not a chat GTP inspired question. Uh, that was not AI. That was actual that, intelligence. AI. That was actual <laughs> intelligence, sir. <laughs> it wasn't not fed by artificial. Trevor or Brian or any of your other coworkers. No, no now. one fed it to me in this one. Wasn't Yardley texting you that one? Uh, no, I don't think so. Man, you got a you you got a a network. Yeah, I got resources, man. Well, we <laughs> yeah. got to keep up with you. Good heavens! Yeah, you're ridiculous with your knowledge sometimes. Well, I mean, I am pretty ridiculous. I'll give you that. This time, <laughs> I had the idea for the question, but I honestly didn't know the answer, so I, I had to look it up what it was, but I thought that'd be a good... Sometimes that's how I roll. I'd just be like, well, that would be interesting. And I'll tell you, I did have a different question that I could not find an answer to, and really? I did not torture you with that, but I will share what that is. And that sure. was uh, a two-parter. You're going to know the first part, but not the second. And the first part is, what was the Iron Duke, and how oh. did it get its name? Ah. Uh. Iron Duke See? was the uh, Pontiac 151 cubic inch four cylinder engine. Yes. Um, to get iron its block, name. iron head. Um, how did they get its name? That I don't know. Nobody does, apparently. Yeah. Uh, the closest thing I found was that some internal engineers just started calling it Iron Duke. They just started yeah. calling it Duke and it stuck. But interestingly, the research on that engine, it's like one of the only production engines in history that was designed not to be a good performer <laughs> yeah, that's about right it was, it was not designed to be low internal friction long lasting not make power just move the car down the road and stay together <laughs> just get from a to b <laughs> yeah right repeatedly just be the appliance <laughs> that's it so a very grandiose oh. name for an appliance engine by the way iron duke yeah no doubt yeah, so that's the trivia question that never was, but um, <laughs> it. there you go. All right, my man. Well, this was uh, this was fun. It was good to to share that story. I hope it wasn't a letdown, keeping people on the hook for a couple episodes. Uh, there there are certainly a lot more stories to come if you uh, dug this show. I will do a quick little plug. Um, again, you heard the uh, stubborn German V eight crosscast. Um, mm. The Stubborn German podcast on its own is also pretty fun to listen to. Uh, but this past week, we also released a Bonneville Up to Speed podcast with special guest Danny Thompson, uh, of course, son of Mickey Thompson and land speed record holder as the fastest piston powered wheel driven streamliner uh, up in the 430 mile per hour range yeah. uh, for a while with Challenger 2. Uh, until he got surpassed by uh, our friends uh, George Poteet and uh, and right. that team, but Danny was a just an awesome guest. Great, great stories, tons of history. Very enthusiastic. He's in his early seventies and he's still out doing it. So I would recommend. Wow. Uh, yeah, checking out the Bonneville Up to Speed podcast. BonnevillePodcast dot com. You'll find it, um, and that's that's a good one. So check that out. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Right on. Well, that's all I got, my friend. That is all I got. I got work to do, man. Woo! The boss is a slave driver. Say, yeah. hey, well, I'll see you tomorrow at work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you on the morning call. Okay. <laughs> that's it. And uh, I don't know. We'll see all the rest of you uh, somewhere down the line. Uh, thanks for listening to this episode of V8 Radio. And uh, remember, if you think it's plugged, it is. <laughs> oh, 